Welcome to Manchester Festival of Libraries, inspired by Library Talk with Michael Rosen. This is hosted by Rochdale Library Service. Uh, I'm Danny Lamb. I'm the senior librarian at Rochdale Central Library, and I'm also an aspiring writer. So this is um, a great honour to be talking and conducting this interview with the great Michael Rosen. Michael Rosen is one of Britain's best loved writers. As far to say, he is a national treasure. Um, Michael has published in the region of 200 books for children and adults, including the sad book, uh, Where I Go on a Bear Hunt, with Helen Oxenbury. And he's currently a professor of children's literature at Goldsmiths, University of London, where he teaches an MA in children's literature. Uh, his most recent book, Many Different Kinds of Books, which is available at your local library now, um, is an emotional and illustrated book about Michael's battle with COVID-19. It features many new poems, it features um, nurses' medical diaries, and it features his own reflections. Uh, it's a tribute to the NHS and the enduring nature of the human spirit. And with that said, I uh, would like to know, uh, how, how are you, Michael? How are you doing? Um, uh, thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too bad. Uh, I can't really see very well out of that eye and I can't hear very well out of my left ear. Uh, I've got numb toes and also I'm sometimes dizzy, uh, vertigo as it's called. Mm -hmm. So I have to deal with those things and they're all a consequence of having had COVID back in March, April and May of, uh, of last year of 2020. I guess, yeah, that's part of the, the long COVID, I suppose, is the things that we don't necessarily hear as much about is it's not just the initial COVID struggle, it's the, it's the things afterwards as well that you've then got to deal with, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very strange illness because they thought at first it was something that affected our lungs, our breathing, so that it was like a pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Then they discovered bit by bit that it affects all sorts of different parts of our body. And that's both mysterious and also for those of us who got it, it means that we're changed. We're, we're, we're a different kind of human being for many of us, not all of us, but I'm one of those. I mean, I don't suppose I'll get much sight back in that eye. The, the, the ophthalmologist, I find that difficult to say, mm -hmm. the ophthalmologist is optimistic. The ear, mm -mm, it seems to have plateaued out into, all I can hear is little people. I can hear bird song in that left ear, but I can't, I wouldn't be able to hear your voice really. The book is a really powerful book it's really emotional it's really poignant um and it's it kind of shows the power of documenting your experiences through writing through diaries and um here at the library service we've got um books on prescriptions which is a way of helping manage your mental health reading um i was just wondering do you think we should be doing more to promote reading and writing as a way of uh, self-care and uh, dealing with any mental health issues we may have and just getting better really? Totally. Yes. I mean, just speaking for a moment for myself, is that if anything troubles me, anything bothers me, any past experience, any memories or something that's happened today or yesterday or half an hour ago, I tend to put words on the page and it might be a single word. And then I put another word after it, maybe another word. And then I'm not bothered about sentences particular. I'll just start a new line and then start a new line. Um, and I find that a very useful way to deal with things. And I, I sort of understand why, because if you think of your head as full of a kind of mass of stuff that you can't fully understand, if you like. So sometimes I think of it as a ping pong ball that's bouncing around against the walls inside your brain. Other times it feels more like a kind of sponge or a mass of mud or something like that. And you can't really make sense of it. You just have a kind of feeling about what it is. And then you say a word will surface. You, all you have to do is just jot it down. You don't have to put it in a sentence. It doesn't have to be beautiful, nothing like that. You just put the word down. It might be sad. It just might be one word or it might be lost. It doesn't matter. And then you wait. And then if another word comes up, you can put it next to it or underneath it. And it really doesn't matter. And as you do that, you don't really know as you're doing it, but you're sorting it out. It may not be the, the right sort necessarily at that stage, but you are sorting it. And then when you've got to a point where you, nothing more you can say, you can look at it and say, have I got that right? Have I told the truth about myself? So that's the question of whether you're being authentic. That's the word we use. Am I being real? Am I being true? Am I being fair? So you can look at that and then say, no, that needs to be there. Or if I said that that came earlier, no, that's, I've exaggerated there. I'm going to think of another word. That's all great. That's sorting. And then you can leave it. And then maybe the next day you do it again. Different thing, different memory, different experience. And then you write that one. 
and then you write another one and then you write another one and this is like what i call a mosaic so you know like the romans made mosaics lots of little tiles and then they built up a picture well it's a bit like that each one of these pages or lines or words is a little tile in your mosaic and that builds up now if you do that i can promise you it's helpful it helps you deal with stuff but also is another way turn that on its head when you read what other people write you go to a library get a book and you read what somebody else has written then what you find is something else goes on which we call empathy you start putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else talking about what happened to them and how they happened it and that's how we learn that's how we grow by sharing stories and we make comparisons between the story i'm reading and the story of me and we keep doing that and that's really important as well for call it mental health call it satisfaction call it happiness joy anything you like so there's two ways the writing and the reading and they they work together like that yeah no that's that's a yeah but it's a valuable insight into your into your process as well i suppose it, it it's almost sounds like a form of like therapy but with yourself the, the writing version and then obviously yeah reading getting the empathy and experiencing things that you may not have experienced other people's trouble but then it helps you deal with your own troubles as well Isn't yes it? yes that's it that's exactly right yeah. i mean we could spend spend our whole time talking just about like reading and writing really but um as this is the uh, festival of libraries it's apps that uh, i ask you what do what libraries mean to you have you got any um childhood memories of libraries um what, what do they mean to you michael uh, i was brought up in a london suburb so uh, sort of outskirts of London, a little place called Pinna. Uh, it was once an old medieval village, but then it got sort of absorbed when the railways went out from London, out northwest, and it became known as living in metro land, a phrase that I used to love as a kid. Well, halfway between our flat, which was over a shop, and the station was the library. And it was a beautiful old red brick building. It's not there anymore, just by a little river that me and my mates used to go exploring in, in our wellies. And almost every Saturday, I went to the library. When I was young, I used to go with my, nearly always with my dad. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but anyway, that's the way it was. I used to go with my dad uh, to the library. And then when I was a bit older, I used to go with my friend, Brian Harrison, who anybody who reads my poems will know we used to call Harry Bow. This was long before Harry Bow Sweets. So, you know, I sometimes tell myself, as a joke that, you know, I invented the name Haribo for Haribo Sweets, but I didn't. But anyway, I just say that. Your royalties, Michael. Your yeah. royalties, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this library uh, it was lovely. I absolutely adored it. I can remember the sound of our feet on the floorboards because there was these old wooden floors um, and there was the main library and then there was a children's library. We had to go in and then back into like a little annex, a little separate room. And um, I used to pore over the books in there. There was a big table in the middle of the room. So you could take any books off the shelf and sit and look at books. And then, of course, you borrowed the books uh, if you wanted to. <clears throat> and uh, so that was sort of phase one, if you like, of libraries in my life. And I can remember very well, a very stern librarian lady. She had uh, what used to be called a bun. She had her hair pulled back and her hair tied up at the back. And she sort of knew our family very well. And she would always sort of call me, even when I was quite young, Mr. Rosen, which I used to think was very funny. Mr. Rosen, mm -hmm. you, you've, you've borrow, you're borrowing three books this week, are you, Mr. Rosen? I'd go, yes. Anyway, so that was fun. Uh, I think it was a twinkle in her eye when she did it. Um, so my friend Harry Bow and I, we used to, he, he invented the idea that even though we were big boys, in other words, we were 11, he'd say let's look at the baby books and when I look back at that what we were doing was looking at picture books which quite often have hidden meanings that you don't notice when you're five or six and he was doing that all those years ago nowadays they're called challenging picture books but in those days we just took picture books off the shelves that we thought were interesting and then we'd sit and talk about them oh. so there we are that was phase one phase two was a bit stricter my dad was a secondary school teacher and he thought that there were certain books I ought to read. So he took me along to the shelf in the grown up library where there was a row of novels by Thomas Hardy. And in those days, Thomas Hardy books were always published in the same way by the same publisher, same edition, 
blue like that and you could see them all every single one of thomas hardy's books and he basically set me the task of reading every single one of them over a period of about two years and he'd say how are you getting on with return of the native aren't you on to the trumpet major yet and that sort of thing my dad was a bit like that very yeah. teacherly <laughs> so that was phase two phase three university uh, no 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 wait a minute sixth form go into the sixth form at school and that was then at Watford District, Watford District Library, County Library, I don't know. Beautiful old library, still there. And I'll tell you what else was still there last time I went. The huge oak table in the reference library where I used to do my homework. Mm -hmm. And last time I went, which was about 10 years ago, the same, same table was still there. And I used to love it. I used to come out of school, go into the library, do my homework, and then go home instead of going home to do my homework, you see. And I used to do that. And then all, all the rest of my life, many, many things, using the British Library, using the Wiener Holocaust Library, uh, using lots of libraries all, all over the place, um, and also sometimes using uh, British Library online. There we are. There's a nice little tip for folks. Through your local library, you can go straight through, use your library ticket number, and you can go through to the incredible resource of the British Library, of um, the Oxford English Dictionary. Oh, it's just incredible. All through your local library. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. You've touched on the fact that the libraries is, is it means something to you at different points in your life as well, at different stages, you need it for different reasons. That, that's really interesting, actually, the evolution of your relationship to libraries as you grow up. Um, one, one, things that libraries are, one thing that libraries are really good at as well is housing uh, rich local history. You can trace your, your family tree, you can search records, search through archives, um, you've recently been tweeting a lot of old photos from uh, growing up in Pinner, um, and you've written lots of non-fiction as well, which I, I guess is um, using history and using archives. So do, do archives inspire you to write? Do you get ideas from archives and local history? Yes, totally. I mean, the moment you start leafing through things that happen to you when you're younger, then your parents' lives, then your grandparents' lives, their relations and so on. It, it's almost like it, it sort of fans out into a whole area. And, you know, you suddenly find that your great-grandparents lived here or there, different parts of the British Isles, different part of Europe, different part of the world. You find out about the hardships they went through or the incredible achievements that they did or, you know, things they tried to do or you find out about separations and illnesses um, you know, we see it on Who Do You Think You Are on the telly and in other programs as well. People find out things about it. And, um, yeah, I've used libraries in order to do that and archives as well. It's all part of libraries. We forget that. So some of my relatives lived in France and France opened up their local archives a few years ago. And it's allowed me to find out some very sad and tragic things that happened to my father's uncles and aunts in France. Um, but that's because they've kept these archives and these are, these are our, how can I call it? They're our resources. You know, it's when we go to big castles or stately homes, we can see that the aristocrats have preserved their past. You know, you go into, we go on a school trip or something like that to a stately home. And then it says the first Duke and the eighth Duke and the 23rd Duke and all that sort of stuff. And these big pictures on the walls. And that's how those people keep a memory of who they are but our memories a bit harder to find but they're there in these archives and they tell us about ordinary lives and about how people lived and managed to struggle to survive because if they hadn't survived we wouldn't be here so yeah. really we're sort of looking at the reason how come we're here that's why that program's called who do you think you are it doesn't explain everything about who you are but it certainly does explain something and also, it's a great way. I mean, I sometimes think of it as like a, a keyhole into history. Yeah. So you could say, oh, well, in 1940, this happened France, this happened there. And that's a fact in history. And then you say, 1940, my father's uncle was in the east of France, and then he ran away to the west of France. And suddenly, France 1940 means something completely different to you. Instead of it just being this dry fact in France, uh, France was invaded in 1940, which is quite hard to learn. And then suddenly you're thinking, oh, is that what happened to Uncle Oscar? Oh, dear. So he got on a train or did he walk? How did he get? And so on. Suddenly you, you've got a reason to know. Yeah. 
The power of the internet is at our fingertips and libraries have embraced digital technology through eBooks. But as the pandemic has highlighted, not everyone has digital access uh, and libraries can be a real lifeline for people. Um, what role do you think libraries can play in the digital world? And what do you think about the future of libraries going forward? Well, to start off with, you've put your finger on it, is that we may have phones, we may have some beat up old computer in the corner of the house uh, or an iPad or something like that. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult, you know, to, to find your way around even on a phone. It, it, it's also may, may not have enough um, energy, you know, whatever it's called, gigabytes or whatever, to get you in there. The point is you've got powerful computers in libraries and also you've got someone to help you. Uh, because, you know, it's very difficult to learn how to search for things and how to find things. And there are all sorts of shortcuts, you know, and I find this, I, I teach at a university, I teach uh, MA students and B, some BA students as well. And uh, even though they've lived through, they've only lived in a time when there have been computers. I mean, you remember, I, uh, computers were invented in my lifetime. So the idea I can walk around with the whole of kind of you know millions of books just in this little tiny thing in my hand is like a it's still a form of magic for me but for people who've been brought up in it brought up with it it's fine but even so I find that some of my students they don't necessarily know the best way to search for things there's all sorts of tricks you can do by putting inverted commas around words and phrases and putting in plus signs um, and thinking of the right things and then getting you through to one site that can open you up into another site. Yeah. All those things we need to learn. And the great thing about librarians is they know how to do it. Um, so, you know, you always, I think, well, go into a library. Don't sit there and just say, oh, well, I can't do it. I can't find it. Mm -hmm. Go into a library and, uh, and find a way because you will find out that in a library, it will help you with homework. It'll help you with your personal history. It'll help you with anything that you need to find out, whether it's the highway code or um, where the nearest uh, facility or whatever it is, hospital, anything. It's, it, all that information is in that place called the library. You don't need to just get stuck with your computer if you, if you, if you can't find out. And more and more archives are opening up. And more and more stuff is being digitized. So any hobby that you've got, you never know. There may be some information there um as well that, that is crucial and and anything anything where there's information being stored for whatever reason and then you can get through to it via a library well we've been uh inundated with questions from the people of rochdale as well uh, many of them library users uh, young and old alike uh, but we've had some particularly great questions from primary school children from around the borough amelia who's in year four she's from new air community primary school says have you ever had haters or received comments online yes Amelia, um, it is one of the downsides of the online world is that people can hate each other as well as help each other. And quite a lot of it goes on. And one of the reasons why is because people can be anonymous. They don't have to say who they are or they can invent a funny name for themselves and then hide behind that and churn out horrible stuff. Well, there's a variety of things we can do. If it's on social media, we can report them. We can mute them and we can block them. So we have three things that we can do. Um, and if you just ignore it as well, you can just think, well, you know, that's their problem. And it may not be even what they believe anyway. And then you can mute it. In other words, they don't know that, you've, uh, that you've, you're not listening to them sort of thing. It's kind of little magic thing you can do. Or you can block them or you can report them. If they've said things that you think they really shouldn't, you can report them to the organisers of, say a social media site like Twitter and you may find that their tweets have been taken down um, it is troubling and of course it is also troubling if it's somebody you know because we know about online bullying cyber bullying as it's called and that's of course even more difficult to deal with if you're a child as you are Amelia I would say immediately talk to an adult you trust so whether that's your mum or your dad or a teacher immediately don't deal with don't handle it try and handle it on your own or, or a librarian you say this person is doing this they're bullying me or whatever and it things will you know sort themselves out that way but you can't handle it on your own and uh, believe it or not I have to do the same I sometimes share something with my wife and she says oh well what you should do is report them or mute them or whatever so even as an adult and I'm 75 uh, I have to go to other people to f find help because it's it's not an easy world to deal with. And uh, so, yeah, thanks for asking that, Amelia.
We've also got one from Isabella, who's also in year four and from New A Community Primary School. Um, she says, we have been learning about Edward Lear and discovered that he published his first book of poetry under the pen name, Derry Down Derry. If you were to choose a pen name other than your own, what would it be and why? Mm. Yes, that's quite Good tricky. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, my mum and dad, they could speak another language. It's called Yiddish that some Jewish people from Eastern Europe originally, Poland and places like that came from. And they used Yiddish words. And maybe I would choose one of them. Now, my mum, she would <laughs> she would sometimes walk into my room or room I shared with my brother, walk in and say, this place is a Mishida monk. I would say, what's a Mishida monk, mum? And she'd say, well, this room. And then walk out. And we'd go, well, what's a Mishida monk? What's a Mishida monk? So I quite like that word, Mishida monk. So I think if I had to have a special pen name, a special name, you know, that could be in inverted commas, I might just write Misha de Monk. And there's another reason for that. My name's Michael. And the nickname for Michael, you know, is Mick, Mickey, Mike. Yeah. And in Yiddish and Polish, it's Misha. Uh -huh. So if I called myself Misha de Monk, yeah. I'd be doing a little kind of wink. Yeah. Uh -huh. at the fact that I'm Misha. It's another form of Michael. In yeah. French, it's Michel. In Spanish, it's Miguel. You know, all over the world, it's got different shapes. So if I call myself Michel de Monk, it would sound I'm like Michael de Monk or something yeah. like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good one. How about that? Will that do? I hope so. <laughs> I think so. Um, and Daniel from Spotland Primary School asks, did your mum ever find out when you took the chocolate cake? My mum was very good at forgetting. That means that, well... To put it really crudely, I'm a spoilt brat. Because though I've made out in that story that my mum was quite strict, really she wasn't at all. I could get away with anything. My dad was a different matter, but my mum, you know, she would sometimes frown, sometimes tut, sometimes go, Michael. Or sometimes she, the worst thing she ever said to me is, you make me tired, you do. She did sometimes say that, and I used to think, ah, but that was as bad as it got. So did my mum, was she really that bothered that I nicked the chocolate cake? No, not really. I think she just thought children are like that. I mean, she, she was really very, very easy going with me. Some would say too easy going, but we'll <laughs> leave that on the shelf for the moment. And uh, Macy, who's also in year six from St. Edward's Primary School, says, <laughs> is anyone else in your family interested in poems? Were you and your family surprised your poems got so big? And how do you not laugh in your videos? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, lots of nice questions there. So my mum wrote poems. My dad wrote poems. My brother writes poems. So that's three of us in our family of four. We did have a brother in between who died. But those four of us, yeah, we all write poems. Uh, my mum, my dad published my mum's poems after she died. My dad wrote poems. There's been a lovely little book called Choosing Your Own Frog. <laughs> Sorry. What's that about? Choosing your own frog. Well, there you go. Um, so my dad, they were both very good writers of poems. My brother writes poems, but he keeps them a bit secret. So I've yet to see many of them. I've seen one or two of them. So maybe he'll, he'll show me some more. Um, so uh, and then what was the last bit? The last there was another extra bit to the question was. Uh, uh, were you and your family surprised that your poems got so big? And uh, the other part was, how do you not laugh in your videos? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think maybe they were a bit. And my, my dad, uh, he was pleasantly surprised. He, he used to like the poems that were rude about him. <laughs> he used to like those. Once when I was reading them and he was in the audience, he sat there going, lies. It's all lies. And people thought, who's that rude bloke shouting at Michael Rosen? Look round. It was my dad. Because I was reading a poem about him. Heckled yeah. my own dad. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was good. Well, how do I stop laughing? Well, they're on film, aren't they? If I laugh, we cut that one and we do it again. And if I laugh again, we cut that. So in the end, we get it. So I've done it so often, I'm not laughing. But all the other ones, I don't know. They, we used to say they've hit the cutting room floor. That's when we used to make film, which was on a strip, and used to cut that bit and throw it on the floor, sweep it up afterwards. Nowadays, it's digital, so it just disappears so you don't see me laughing at my own jokes um, 
Uh, Mary, age 11, says, how did it feel to walk outside again after three months? Ah, uh, it was amazing. Um, I mean, in hospital, it's incredible. People make you better when you've been very, very, very ill. And if they hadn't done what they did, well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be here. And this applies to all of us who've come out of hospital and had our lives saved, which is what they did. They saved my life. Um, but having said that, in a funny sort of way, hospital is a bit like prison. You know, I don't want to say bad, anything bad about hospitals, but you are stuck there and you can't move. And you look up at the window and you wonder what it's like going on out there and you can't go out there. And in my case, I couldn't even stand up. I was just lying in bed. My legs weren't strong enough to stand up. And so I did feel, I mean, another word we use is confined. That means you're just stuck in a single place. Yeah. And they taught me how to walk. They taught me how to stand up first. I had to learn how to stand up, then how to walk. But all that was still indoors at a place called St Pancras Rehabilitation Hospital. And then finally I could walk. And um, shall I tell you what my wife said? Yeah. I said, I said to her, I said, uh, I may have to come home in a wheelchair. And she said, you're not. What, what do you mean? She said, well, you're not coming home in a wheelchair. You'll walk home. Well, I said, yeah, you'll walk through the door. And I said, I, I don't think so. You'll, you'll walk through the door. Mm. And I said, then I said, I'm walking with a stick, Emma. So I may come in with it. You won't. <laughs> so in actual fact, what happened was when I came in, I was holding my stick, but I wasn't walking with it. Yeah. And that was the stick I called Sticky McStick Stick. <laughs> and so with Sticky McStick Stick in my hand, but not pushing, I did I did exactly as she said, because I got from the wheelchair to the stick and then not even using the stick. And wow. it just felt amazing. I mean, I, it's very difficult to describe, you know, three months indoors, not moving really. And then suddenly, chung, there it was, the world. <laughs> amazing. Wow. Um, and we've got one from Tracy from Haywood who says, have you ever been jealous of something another author wrote? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to describe. Sometimes when you read something and you think it's so beautiful and so lovely and so wonderful, my first feeling is to feel excited by it. And then I may think, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great to write like that? So, you know, there's a very famous poem by a poet called Langston Hughes, an African-American poet um, who came from Harlem. And he wrote a poem called I Too Sing America. In a way, it's a bit like kind of taking the knee, but in a poem. I mean, it is incredible. Do look it up, go yeah. to your library, yeah. find Langston Hughes, I Too Sing America. And it's a fantastic poem because it's very, very simple, but so profound, so deep, makes you think. And when I, every time I read that poem, I think, oh, I wish I could write like that, but I'm not jealous of him. I'm not envious of him. I don't think eh, Langston Hughes eh. and another poet, poet, he wrote a thing. It's a bit difficult to describe, but it was a radio play called Under Milk Wood. Oh, yes. And his name's Dylan Thomas. And he wrote, it's like a whole set of poems about a whole town that doesn't exist. Well, it does really, because it's the ch town he remembers when he was a child. And he's written it through lots of different voices. And every time I hear bits of it, I think, oh, wouldn't it be great to write something like that? And in fact, my wife sent it in as a recording to play on a, on a tablet when I was in hospital to help me wake up because I was in a coma. That means I was unconscious. And so some of the first things I heard as I was coming around was Under Milk Wood by Dylan Thomas. And I remember saying to the nurse, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. And I did feel at that moment, if only I could write something that where people would hear that and go, wow. So it's, it's kind of not jealous. It's more like just, I wish I could be as good as that. I've um, got a final question here. Um, has your family history been a special motivator in writing stories or teaching or lessons, especially children? Yes, in lots of different ways. You see, as I said earlier, both my mum and dad actually were teachers. And they both loved books and stories and literature and plays and films, songs. My dad loved lots of different songs uh, in English, but also in other languages. Um, and all that, it kind of taught me that this world of books um, 
very much so. My dad used to, and both my mum and dad used to love, if they were reading a book, they would look up and go, hey, you like this, and then read from it. And you'd think, wow, that's really interesting. So also, they were great storytellers themselves. So if something funny happened, let's say we were on holiday, we often used to go camping. And so you always get adventures when you go camping, you know, the night that, you know, the, the bumblebee got in the tent or you know, the night that somebody fell into, well, I won't say where they fell, but anyway, we didn't have toilets, put it that way. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, any of these stories, and we would have these adventures. And then when we came home from the holiday, I noticed that my mum and dad would then tell the stories to friends and relations. So we'd all sit round, and my mum and dad would tell these stories. And I'd think, wow, isn't that funny? You know, people are laughing, and I could see my dad exaggerating, you know, a story that started with, my brother going off on another camping holiday and my dad running after him turned into a great chase in the car and arriving on a platform and running down the platform going, stop the train, I've got the key. He just made it all up. He didn't do it. And it, I just used to think he's making it up and people loved it. Yeah. And you see, of course, that taught me. And then now, as I'm a, a, a teacher in a university and my students are more often than not teachers themselves and they're trying to find out one of their jobs is to find out how children respond to books, how they read books, what do they think when they're reading books. And so we sit in our classes discussing what are the best ways to find out. And one of the best ways is to get children to tell stories about the books they're reading. So can you see, I've come all the way around. What am I talking about? Stories about stories about stories. And so some of the students are finding that, of course, you can say, you know, Billy had a blue hat. What colour was the hat? Blue, one mark. You can do that. That's like exams, isn't it? You know, uh, or you can say, do you know anyone else has got a hat? And then you tell a story about someone got a hat. And you say, do you know anybody who lost a hat? And then suddenly people have got stories about hats and things like that. And then you can go back to the first story. Billy had a blue hat. And it might tell you some things. And I often think that one of the ways we can find out about what things mean is to tell another story and then go back to the first story and you compare the two stories and that way I think we learn a lot more than if people just point the finger and go what color was Billy's hat that's my view yeah yeah I absolutely agree um so yeah it's been thanks for talking to us today Michael it's been fantastic um and to close it out I was just wondering if you'd be able to read something that maybe reminds you of libraries or archives or something on that line yeah so all families have mysteries, don't they? There's always something that somebody says, oh, I don't know why Uncle Joe did that, or I don't know where Abdul came. When, when, when did Abdul come? And someone says, I don't know. When did Abdul come? No, I don't know. And there are always these little mysteries. Well, one of the first things I'll say is grab the mystery. Get the mystery, get it down on paper or remember it, scribble it down, and then go to a library and see if you can find out. Here's the mystery in my family. And I'll tell you a little bit afterwards as to what I did. Every now and then, my father would say, I had two French uncles. They were in France at the beginning of the war. They weren't there at the end. What happened to them? We'd say. Don't know, he'd say. All I know is that they were there at the beginning of the war and they weren't there at the end. So can you see there's a mystery then there are questions, and then there are more questions. What were their names? Maybe your mum or dad knows their names. Do you know all their names? When were they born? Now we've got, we could start working on that. We could maybe go to sites that tell you about names. There's family tree sites, that sort of thing. And then maybe we could start. I mean, in my case, I did have names. I had some places. And then there was an old letter that was found in America. In fact, four letters. That helped. Then I could, because I can speak French, I started writing to France. I went to a very special library in London called the Vena Holocaust Library, and they helped me. And there was another librarian in France. Suddenly I built up a very, very terrible and sad story, which in fact I ended up as a book, which you can find. And it's called The Missing. There we are. I don't know whether you can see that, the light shining on it. Mm -hmm. The Missing. There we are. You can see it. In fact, yeah, it's by Michael Rosen. That is me, isn't it? Yeah. It says <laughs> the true story of my family in World War II. And in it, I tell you both the story of what happened to my father's uncles and aunts, but also how I found out bit by bit. And it's like a detective story because that's it. You see, when you use libraries, in a way, you're like a detective. You're trying to find out step by step. 
So that poem really expresses how I was as a child not knowing, and this book expresses what I found out, thanks to libraries and archives. Wow. Well, thank you very much for talking to us, Michael. It's been it's been fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, you can get all of Michael Rosen's uh, books in your local library, including his new one, which is many different kinds of love. And uh, we do hope that you uh, that you go into a library and explore the world. Agreed. Yes. Good. <laughs>